Now you talk about terror. What about for me? I've been terrorized all my day. I'm all my day. Welcome to the Chris Hedges Report. Rulers divide the world into worthy and unworthy victims. Those we are allowed to pity, such as Ukrainians enduring the hell of modern warfare, and those whose suffering is minimized, dismissed, or ignored. The terror we and our allies carry out against Iraqi, Palestinian, Syrian, Libyan, Somali, and Yemeni civilians is part of the regrettable cost of war. We echoing the empty promises from Moscow claim we do not target civilians. Rulers always paint their militaries as humane. They are to serve and protect. Collateral damage happens, but it is regrettable. This lie can only be sustained among those who are unfamiliar with the explosive ordnance and large kill zones of missiles, iron fragmentation bombs, mortar, artillery and tank shells, and belt-fed machine guns. This bifurcation of the world into worthy and unworthy victims, as Edward Herman and Noam Chomsky point out, in Manufacturing Consent, the Political Economy of Mass Media, is a key component of propaganda, especially in war. The Russian-speaking population in Ukraine to Moscow are worthy victims. Russia is their savior. The millions of refugees and the millions of Ukrainian families cowering in basements, car parks, and subway stations are unworthy Nazis. Worthy victims allow citizens to see themselves as empathetic, compassionate, and just. Worthy victims are an effective tool to demonize the aggressor. They are used to obliterate nuance and ambiguity. Mention the provocations carried out by the Western alliance with the expansion of NATO beyond the borders of a unified Germany, a violation of promises made to Moscow in 1990, the stationing of NATO troops and missile batteries in Eastern Europe, the U.S. involvement in the ouster in 2014 of Ukrainian President Viktor Yan Yanukovych, which led to the civil war in the east of Ukraine between Russian-backed separatists and Ukraine's army, a conflict that has claimed tens of thousands of lives, and you are dismissed as a Putin apologist. It is to taint the sainthood of the worthy victims, and by extension ourselves. We are good. They are evil. Worthy victims are used not only to express sanctimonious outrage, but to stoke self-adulation and a poisonous nationalism. The cause becomes sacred, a religious crusade. Fact-based evidence is abandoned, as it was during the calls to invade Iraq. Charlatans, liars, con artists, fake defectors, and opportunists become experts used to fuel the conflict. Joining me to discuss this duplicity and mendacity is Peter Oburn, a former political commentator of The Spectator, The Daily Telegraph, and Daily Mail, who covered the war in Yemen. He currently writes about politics for open democracy and Middle East Eye and is the author of The Triumph of the Political Class, as well as The Rise of Political Line. So, Peter, I want to begin with Yemen, a country you know well. You covered it as a reporter. Uh, it's been defined by the United Nations as the greatest humanitarian calamity of the 21st century. And I wondered if you could juxtapose the West's response to this seven-year assault on Yemen, uh, which has left about 240,000 dead, resulted in widespread famine, cholera epidemics, with a response to the Ukraine. Uh, and in that response, I wondered if you could speak about the visit to the Polish border by Samantha Power, the administrator of the U.S. Agency for International Development. Indeed, starting with Samantha Power, she was the U.S. ambassador, I think, to the United Nations at the very start of the Yemen conflict, and she was in a great position uh, to stop it or to deal with the problem. Uh, but she didn't. She never addressed uh, the Yemen, or for that matter, as far as I know, the impending genocide of the Rohingya or the um, the terrible events in Gaza and so on. 
so, it, it, and yet there she is, uh, very shortly after the uh, terrible tragedy of the Ukraine starts, uh, there she is at the Polish border. Uh, but, uh, so this is a correct cause in her mind, whereas the other causes, um, less interesting. And I do find that this myself, as a British citizen, particularly troubling. I went, you're right, but I've only been once. It's very hard to get to Yemen as a reporter. Um, I, I, and uh, I went there towards the start of the war in 2016. And it was a very, very difficult to get in. And what you uh, saw was a, a, an attack on the uh, Yemeni people, effectively, by Saudi Arabia. The, the, the uh, and a, in a coalition backed by uh, Britain and the United States uh, and with uh, other uh, local parties also involved, such as the UAE. Now, um, I um, I saw it, uh, the legal situation is, is different because the internationally recognized government is actually based in Saudi Arabia. And I won't get into the details, but the, the, the murderous nature of the assault on the Yemeni people is utterly unspeakable and horrible. And as you just were saying, I mean, I think according to the latest figures I've seen, something like 230,000 people out of a population of 20,000 20 million have died, uh, partly uh, through Saudi bombing and so forth, but also through uh, starvation and cholera and, and, the, and the, the siege of the Yemen, which has been going on now for this awful time. And now, it really hits me as a British citizen that Britain is the pen holder at the United Nations. We are responsible for, for managing the war, as it were. It is also the case uh, that we supply many of the uh, arms to the, 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 the to, to the Saudi government, and we do more than that. We actually sort of, I think, we we handle them. We advise the Saudis. We we give them all kinds of advice and on the missions, uh, and we make a very healthy profit on the side of it. Uh, so we have a huge moral responsibility for a war which is far longer and has taken responsible for the deaths of far more people uh, than anything which, uh, by the way, don't get, get this wrong. I mean, the, Putin is guilty of a war of aggression in the UK, Ukraine, but it is claimed far more lives in Yemen than has so far, uh, inshallah, happened in, 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 in Ukraine. Ken, can you explore why? What, what do you uh, think the disparity in terms of the response is due to? It's a really deep question. And actually, I think this is a really shaming thing. Um, there's a very fine British diplomat who, a whistleblower, I'm ashamed to say I've forgotten her name, but she's come, gone public and talked about sitting in a room with Boris Johnson, the now the British Prime Minister, when she was uh, at, when he was, at the, they were both at the Foreign Office, and they were talking about what to do about the uh, Yemen situation. And Joris, Boris Johnson was just laughing about, you know, joking about what, according to her account, which is extremely credible, uh, and I think nobody challenges it. Uh, it been making jokes while the uh, grave, these very grave issues affecting the lives of millions of people uh, we are being discussed. And, and you have to reach the conclusion that uh, the life the life of an Arab in Yemen is not of anything like the same with Kant, and I think really doesn't count at all in the eyes of of, of the international community, whereas there's a much greater um, uh, weight put on the lives of, of Ukrainian people, which is excellent. But I, 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 I'm very happy about that. I, I s s salute the Ukrainian people fighting the aggression of Putin. But what I upsets me and shames me, I think, and shames all of us, is that we don't put the same weight or anything like the same weight uh, on the lives of, of the Yemeni people. What does it do to? Why don't we put the same weight on the lives of Palestinians or Yemenis or Iraqis? 
Well, I think you've got, to, if you looked at the media coverage, uh, uh, and not just media coverage of the, uh, those are the remarks by politicians about the Ukrainian situation. Uh, they draw attention to the fact that Ukraine is, is in Europe. Some people have reflected that they are civilized um, and they have a blue eyes, I think has been a phrase used occasionally. In other words, they, they are, they are uh, Chris, maybe that people are saying they are mainly they're sort of Christian Europeans. Now, Actually, if you went, I went to I went to Yemen. It's an incredibly beautiful place, fabulous architecture, an incredible deep, deep history. I spent I I spent so many fascinating evenings with really civilized, intelligent people with a, with a deep history stretching back thousands of years. They were civilized well before. <laughs> Europe, let alone America. It's supposing America ever has got civilized, arguable point. I, but certainly well before. If we're going to Sana, the capital of Yemen, and this these incredible mud skyscrapers, which have been a lot of which have been destroyed by the Saudis. I mean, it's like going to Venice in terms of the sheer beauty and architectural scope. Uh, or, or Florence. I mean it it's an incredible civilization, and yet, clearly, in the uh, in the Western uh, mind, I'm ashamed to say, that doesn't count. It isn't something which matters. They are simply uncivilized people who do not deserve the same respect. We do not. Don't, we are not. They don't. Their rights to have do not count in the same way as the rights of Europeans in in Ukraine count. There was a social media uh, footage of a 16-year-old Palestinian girl who confronted an Israeli soldier. This was repackaged on uh, TikTok and was sent out as a Ukrainian girl confronting a Russian soldier. Uh, and I, what, does that, what does that tell us about the Russian invasion of the Ukraine? Uh, and what does it tell us about the Israeli occupation of Palestinian land? There was a... A picture went out, sorry, a film went out during the um, the early stages in the Ukrainian conflict. It was of a very young uh, girl, maybe 11 or 12 years old, confronting a, a soldier. It was presented as a as a Ukrainian uh, young girl confronting a Soviet, uh, sorry, excuse me, a Russian soldier um, uh, uh, and being very brave and standing up to him. Uh, and this was uh, reportedly uh, kind of got 12 million uh, views on social media. Now, actually, that was a repackaged picture of video of uh, a young girl called Ahed Hamimi who ended up being arrested by the Israelis, confronting a, 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 a uh, an Israeli soldier in that way. But of course, and it did cause some stir at the time. Uh, in, uh, but the, m nothing, nothing like the impact which the fake package, the package when she became a Ukraine, this, this Palestinian girl, repackaged as a Ukrainian young woman or girl, with, that was a, a much bigger thing. So it, it is interesting to compare and contrast. I I want to ask about what this means when you bifurcate the world into kind of worthy and un worthy victims, what this does uh, for uh, those who want to hold war criminals accountable. Uh, if worthy victims are deserving of justice and unworthy victims are not, what are the consequences in terms of uh, dealing with war crimes? Well, it's a very difficult question and something which is very relevant. Um, you and I both covered in different ways the Iraq, the, the British American invasion of Iraq. There is no question that that was, under international law, a war of aggression. And in that, therefore, that makes the British Prime Minister Tony Blair and the American President George W. Bush war criminals. I mean, actually, I've got, I was before coming on the show, I was preparing for the uh, this conversation and the Nuremberg Tribunal 
said, this is quoting from the, um, from the tribunal, the judge, to initiate a war of aggression is not only an international crime, it is the supreme international crime differing only from other war crimes in that it contains within itself the accumulated evil of the whole. Now, there is no question that Mr. Putin has done exactly that. He has initiated a war of aggression in the Ukraine. And he should be, and, and, and there are voices saying that he should be held accountable. But on the other hand, there is no question either that Tony Blair and George W. Bush initiated a war of aggression in Iraq. They didn't have, it wasn't a war of defense, which you, which you can fight under international law. It did not have United Nations Security Council justification or agreement, and of course it was based on a fabrication, the fabrication of weapons of mass destruction. So on the, if you are going to call for Mr. Putin to, uh, to get to be charged with the ultimate war crime, you must also, you must be consistent, and you must call for Mr. Bush and Mr. Blair also uh, to be um, called to account in exactly the same way. And what are the consequences for, in essence, a world that doesn't abide by the rule of law, that uh, people who commit war crimes yeah. when they're in power in Washington or in the UK are not held accountable, and, uh, and Putin is? Well, do you know, I'm um, you're very privileged, and I'm very privileged. I'm a British citizen. I, you, I presume, an American citizen. We're both belong to uh, great countries which have over the time over time uh, claim uh, built up of the, the democracy rule of law parliament a free press all these things which we are taught about at school and i certainly believed in when i was taught about them at school and we were taught at my school how amazing america was about what because it it was the bastion of all of this against um Evil doers, in particular, at that time when I was a young boy, uh, the Soviet Empire. And what I have, it breaks my heart actually that Britain and America no longer, or have chosen no longer to abide by those values. Actually, what there was a British phrase, fair play. Uh, and we prided ourselves. We were taught that it's very strong. It was what we stood for, free speech, fair play, decency, rule of law, parliamentary democracy, representative democracy. Now, if we're going to say we stand for those things and, and assert that on the international stage, we must be consistent about it. We can't say that whatever we do, when we commit a crime of aggression, that's fine. That's something which is perfectly reasonable because it's just. And when somebody we review as an enemy does it, that is that's terrible. That he needs to be held to account and, and put on trial. That doesn't that doesn't have any credibility. And it explains, by the way, something which has been un, misun, under heavily underreported in this conflict is the amount of support which. Russia is getting across the globe, particularly in the Middle East. Because if you're in the Middle East, and I, you and I have both gone there a lot and talked to a lot of people from there, they, they see us as aggressors. They see our, you know, NATO as an aggressive thing which has no respect for law and has destroyed countries. Now, if we, if we, in other words, we have betrayed our own values and it has diminished our ability to be taken seriously and with, the, with respect on the international stage. I want to talk about the media's response to the Ukraine and have you comment on what's happened to our own trade as foreign correspondents. Um, Something I don't. I mean, I don't know. Um, the, the history of foreign reporting has had its ups and ups and downs. 
Um, and actually, uh, you know, th- th- there have always been foreign correspondents who have been spies or they have simply been happy to amplify the um, propaganda message of whichever uh, country they represent. Um, on the other hand, there's also been a tradition, which is the one which I think most reporters would claim to adhere to, which is you, the purpose of being a foreign correspondent uh, is to try and tell the truth. Now, this is a very difficult thing to do, but in war it's pretty well impossible because you're just, um, not that I have ever been on a battlefield, I should say, you're stuck, and you have, I know, Chris, you're stuck in the corner of the battlefield. There's really nothing which you can know about what's going on. You know, think of Tolstoy's great description of Napoleon at Borodino, and even Napoleon, the general, doesn't know what's actually happening. Uh, and um, the uh, so the um, uh, and so, just, uh, but what we should aim at is a culture of some kind of detachment. Uh, in my view, it's reporting from any country around the world. We should listen to the all voices, including unpopular voices, ones which are people who are despised and even hated. They have a story to tell. Often, it's a very interesting story which enables you to understand things you you never understood and what we and actually i'd love to hear what you think about this my observation is that we have moved to a form of reporting of engagement you're only allowed to report one side of the story in the west that is what it feels like looking not just at, at ukraine but other recent uh, conflicts as well. There's one set of good guys and one set of bad guys. In fact, there are no good guys. You know, it's 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 much much more complicated uh, than that. Well, yes. I mean, what's not reported certainly in the United States, and I was in Eastern Europe covering the collapse of the uh, communist bloc in the Soviet Union in 1989. What's not reported is that was there was universal understanding that expanding NATO beyond the borders of a unified Germany was an unnecessary provocation that would uh, have uh, disastrous consequences. This was universally accepted across the board by Henry Kissinger, George Kennan, Hans Dietrich Genscher, Margaret Thatcher, everyone. Indeed, yes, George. There's a famous sort of piece of analysis by George Kennan who really set out the strategy for the Cold War after 1945 against Soviet Russia and then comment that we're still around at the end of the at the fall of the Berlin Wall uh, to, to make a very wise remark. Now it doesn't mean that's right. It's, it's perfectly reasonable to say absolutely Ukraine should be free. It shouldn't be part of a Soviet, sorry, excuse me, a Russian sphere of influence. But it's it, even to sort of start talking along those lines, you get accused of somehow being a Putin ally or a Putin um, propagandist. And what the, what that means is you can't really have an intelligent uh, discussion anymore about these immensely important matters. By the way, this isn't just a problem um, with foreign affairs and wars. It's a problem generally, I think, in the West. There has been a... Um, something's happened to public uh, discourse uh, whereby it's very hard to have a, an even-handed, well-informed discussion. We have developed this very seriously bad habit of accusing our ideological enemies, with us people who disagree with us, of bad faith uh, and having malign motives and being apologists for terrible things. Now. I think we need to escape, to return to a much more, I can just give you a personal personal story, actually. I was a schoolboy in a boarding school in the West Country, England, called Sherburn, in the early 1970s. Um, and we had, there was a wonderful history teacher called Graham Stevenson, who was not at all liked by the school authorities. He was... Um, he, he, he was quite dangerous. He liked to hurl, he had a stick which you hurl at you in class and that didn't 
but it was to keep us alert. And he did keep us alert before my time, but he wanted to take a school trip to the Les Evenements in Paris in 1968 so that the boys could see uh, history in motion. But what I remember, and I really learned from it, which is the height of the Cold War, just, after, just around the time of the Chilean uh, coup d'etat uh, created by the CIA, it was a very dangerous time in the world. He brought down, and he used to do this a lot, the political officer of the Soviet embassy to speak to us about dialectical material and give the sort of general Soviet view of the world. He keeps have Soviet Weekly would be there alongside the Times Literary Supplement and New Statesman in the school library so we could read it. Now, this is, we were then, a, the serious the situation vis-a-vis -vis Russia between Russia and the West was marked by deeper hostility then than it is now. It was the existential enemy of the West. It was perfectly reasonable at this school for, for, for us to be introduced to people who were going to tell us uh, about uh, how the Soviet Union saw the world. Now, that's a, that's a brilliant thing. By the way, Tim Garth Nash, who was uh, another student there, just a year or two above me, who'd written a book about free speech, was another student of this great, great, truly great school teacher, history teacher. And I'd like to know what he thinks, because it really upsets me, for instance, that in Britain, uh, Russia Today, RT, has been closed down. It's not that I agree with RT particularly, but it's just that it's, you know, we were allowed at 16 year old schoolboys to read, you know, Pravda, Soviet Weekly. We were introduced to the officials from the regime. And this was, this was, we learned how the other side thought. This is about, we learned, we understood. And they had some decent points, by the way, I seem to remember. It didn't mean that I ended up joining the Communist Party. Well, that's key. I was a foreign correspondent for 20 years, and you develop a linguistic, a cultural, historical, religious literacy that allows you to look at your own country, in this case, you know, step into the shoes of someone from the Middle East, someone from Latin America. And yeah. uh, of course, Russia, given its history, it was invaded uh, in uh, the 20th century by the Nazis with and that laid waste to the Soviet Union and the century before that, Napoleon did the same thing. It has uh, historical reasons to fear encirclement. And, uh, and of course, I think that is what has been lost, especially with the steep decline in foreign bureaus and foreign coverage. Uh, we worked very, very hard to do exactly what you said, which was to present the other perspective. And, and many times that perspective had to be heard because it had many legitimate grievances and many legitimate points, I think especially coming out of the Middle East. Uh, that's true. And also, there's a second point here. I mean, we claim to represent, you know, free, we claim that free speech is one of our great values. It's the, you know, there you have, you have the First Amendment of your Constitution, we have, we can point to John Stuart Mill and his classic on liberty defense of, of free speech. And yet we seem terrified of allowing it. Uh, it's not just that there's only one point of view can be safely projected on the uh, mass media now in the West, but it's also that they're actually closing down channels, which, uh, which presents a, 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 another way of seeing the world. And that suggests to me a, a, two things, actually. One is a, a deep insecurity about something, and I think we need to drill down to know what's going wrong, but also a very emphatic, explicit repudiation of what we actually stand for. It's not just free speech, of course, which we are now turning our back on, but it's also the rule of law, um, and it's also in certain respects, democracy itself. It's, it's a real kind of, it's a real crisis for the West, a lack, a lack, of, the com lack of confidence in what we are. Great. That was Peter Oburn. I want to thank the Real News Network and its production team, Cameron Granadino, Adam Coley, Dwayne Gladden, and Kayla Rivera. 
You can find me at chrishedges.substack.com.